Welcome to Mining the Deep, a podcast series by Sustainable Asia. My name is Marcy Trent Long. In the previous two episodes, we looked at the growing need for minerals to build our renewable energy sources. We saw how deep seabed mining might offer a solution, but we also learned about the risks of destroying unique habitats like hydrothermal vents and the financial burden these experimental ventures can have on developing nations. In this episode, we'll follow mining company Deep Green out to the open ocean more specifically to the Clarion-Clipperton Zone. The Clarion-Clipperton Zone, or the CCZ, or the CCZ, depending upon your nationality, it's probably the most studied area for these seabed deposits in the world. This is a recording from the 2009 meeting by the International Seabed Authority. They're discussing an area of seabed the size of the United States, stretched out in the Pacific waters between Hawaii and Mexico. And it is in this area that most of the large deposits have been found over time. The mineral deposits in this area are concentrated in what's known as nodules. Potato-sized lumps of black rock full of manganese, nickel, and other minerals. They form over thousands of years when mineral particles sink to the bottom of the ocean and accumulate around a hard object like a shark's tooth. So if they're just there, lying on the seafloor, maybe they could solve our demand for minerals. It's a resource made by Mother Nature that just happens to sit on the abyssal plain, 4,000 meters below sea level, in one concentrated area. This is Gerard Barron. We've heard him in episode two as well. He's the CEO of mining company Deep Green. This is a very, very unique resource with enough nickel and cobalt and manganese and copper to electrify our entire transport fleet four times over. You know, it's not full of gold. It's not full of precious metals. It's full of base metals that we need to build batteries. I also spoke with Dr. Gregory Stone, the chief scientist at Deep Green. These base metals, the copper, the nickel, the cobalt, the manganese, the atomic properties of these metals, is, we can't replace that. They're really quite extraordinary. They're like rubber bands. They kind of store energy and release it. Gregory and Gerard are clearly sold on the concept. And that's understandable. If the world accepts deep seabed mining, this could become a multi-billion dollar industry with deep green at the forefront. So it's worth trying to understand what these nodules really mean for our renewable energy future and what opponents of deep seabed mining think. Here's Dr. David Santillo, the Greenpeace scientist we've heard previously. And I think that there's a, a real danger in conflating the green revolution with a need inevitably to mine the seabed. It's true that we're using a lot more metals now and quite a, a range of different metals, including those rare earths that we perhaps weren't using anything like as extensively in the past. And that if we move towards an increasingly electronics-based uh, economy in, in lots of countries, smart technologies, if we're moving towards renewable energy, that the demands for some of those minerals are going to increase, at least in the in the short term. But the question is really, what can we do about the supplies of those? Some of those minerals that we go to such lengths to get out from resources on land, they're recycled at the moment less than 1%. That's a good point. Do we even need to mine the seabed if we already have so much nickel and copper in the products we throw away every day. We need, as a society, to make much better use of the resources that we have. Matthew Gianni from Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. And until we get up to a level where we're recycling the kinds of metals that are found in the deep ocean in the products we're using today, we shouldn't be opening up a whole new area of resource exploitation with unknown ecological consequences before we start making better use of what we already have. When people look into the future, they see minerals still as a non-renewable resource, of course, but also as a non-recyclable resource, almost as a single-use resource. And if we look at it in that way, then, of course, you're looking at something which is finite on land and equally is going to be finite if we mine the seabed. So this is not a solution to an unending supply of minerals. 
And if we've got the ingenuity as a species to even consider going out and mining the seafloor, surely we can put that ingenuity to better use, to protect the seabed and to make much better use and much smarter use of the minerals that we have already. I put that question to Gerard and Gregory of Deep Green. Do they not agree that for a truly sustainable future, we need to work towards a circular economy? As an organization, we're big believers in the circular economy. Circular economy is all about, you know, moving towards more recycling. And, and I often hear people say recycling is, should take the place. We shouldn't need to mine anything new. We should just recycle. Well, that's just, unfortunately, an uninformed position because to allow recycling, you need a bigger baseload of metals. You know, you need to be able to have a more metals in the system, and then you need to encourage recycling. We do believe that in some number of years, it's possible to acquire enough metal with a corresponding recycling strategy for those metals that we should be able to close that loop. But we simply don't have enough in circulation right now to do that. That's true. Take copper, for instance. More than 80% of copper is currently recycled, but the demand for copper is so high that all the recycled copper amounts to just a third of what we need. So only when we have more copper in our production and recycling systems will we be able to close the loop. But if we can close the loop in the near future, is it even worth it to start up a whole new extractive industry in the meantime? We're taking a short break to thank our sponsors and partners. Media X is in Hong Kong cultivating Asia's next generation of media innovators and entrepreneurs. Media X is based out of the Journalism and Media Studies Center at the University of Hong Kong, where Sustainable Asia is recorded. Make sure you check out China Dialogue and China Dialogue Ocean bilingual websites for informative discussions on China and the environment. They're VPN-free in China, have an active WeChat group, and you can also follow them on Twitter. Now back to the podcast. In 2016, researchers at the University of Technology, Sydney, looked at the quantity of minerals that is economically available to mine on land, and they concluded a transition towards 100% renewable energy supply can take place without deep seabed mining. I put those results to Gregory. That's true. But you have to think about where that metal is. All the high-grade ore sites, are, you know, people go there first. And we've already started to move down, I'm told, to lower-grade terrestrial ores. And also nickel, some or much or a lot of that is found in beneath tropical rainforest. So you've, you want to think about where that metal is going to come from that is in the ground. But yes, if you want to just keep digging and going for the terrestrial deposits, you can keep doing that. It's true. So if we want to get enough base materials in the system to achieve a circular economy, it's not really a question of whether we need to be mining the seabed, but whether we prefer it over mining on land. And this is the key argument. You'll hear it from everyone who supports deep seabed mining. It's the best option. The challenge when you're getting a new industry going is how do you benchmark what you're doing versus what the known alternatives are? And the known alternatives, of course, are what's happening on land. And that's there for all of us to see. So the question when we're trying to build the case for ocean nodules is, is it better? The fact is we don't have to do any of the things that are normally associated with land-based mining. We don't have to blast and drill and, and create nasty tailings ponds. Tailings, by the way, is what's left over after the minerals have been separated from the ore. You can understand why people are anxious when you look at you know, you wake up in the morning and you realize there's been a tailings dam spill in Papua New Guinea or villages have been wiped out in Brazil due to tailings collapse. You know, people are suspicious of the mining industry. You don't have that with this. You don't have tailings. You have these rocks that you pick up 
and you process them. I see it as the uh, most earth-friendly way to get these metals. I know we're not tearing down hydrothermal vents here, like the lost city or the ones with the scaly foot snail. These are just nodules, rocks with a bunch of minerals in them that we can scoop up, right? They're basically finding that these so-called polymetallic nodules with metals such as cobalt, nickel, magnesium, and copper in them are actually ecosystems of relatively high biodiversity. So animals live on and among these nodules? To find out more, I asked Chong Chen, the deep sea biologist who studies the scaly foot snail. Uh, so we have new species of sponges and also mollusks. There, there are these uh, very rare mollusks called monoplacophorans that love the nodules and they will basically occur only on the nodules. Many species have only ever been found on the nodules. And then you have small species. So they're not big. So they're not big animals like the hydrothermal vent ones because there's no energy production. But you have many, many small species like worms, uh, snails, limpets, and sponges that live on these nodules and nowhere else. So whereas in hydrothermal vents, you get large species like crabs and sea worms all grouped together around the vent system. Habitats like nodule fields are much more widespread. That's Julia Sigwart, Chong's research partner. They're much more difficult to study in terms of the biodiversity, what's there, how abundant the animals are, what the ranges of the species that live there. We actually know much less about the biodiversity in nodule fields. That doesn't mean the biodiversity isn't there and isn't valuable. It just means that it's spread out over a bigger area. And even though the animals that live there are so spread out, the nodule mining still poses a high risk to their survival because of the scale of this activity. If you put a mining operation into one of these areas and the mining occurs at the level which is the target production levels established by the ISA, the International Seabed Authority, which is roughly 3 million tons of nodules per year, a typical mining operation over the course of a 25 to 30 year contract would directly impact in somewhere between 8 and 10,000 square kilometers of ocean bottom and have a knock-on impact of another 10 or several tens of thousands of ocean bottom. But Gerard of Deep Green says we're looking at this all wrong. When asking the question, what's better, mining on land or in the ocean? You can't look at that question and, and answer it in one simple, by looking at one simple area. And so we decided that it was necessary to do a full life cycle analysis from cradle to gate, looking at a multitude of areas. So what Gerard and his team did was to look at seven areas of potential damage, things like biodiversity loss, but also the amount of carbon it would release. They compared the results for both mining methods and found that, on the whole, land-based mining would be worse than seabed mining. And there's a lot of assumptions that people, especially NGO people, like to jump to. And that's because they don't look at these seven areas. They look at their area. And... You know, as responsible citizens of the planet, you know, I think you can't afford to do that. You have to look at this from a complete ecosystem perspective. But there's one key problem with this. Right now, we already have land-based mining. So is that just going to stop when we start mining the ocean? It's not simply a question of, you know, do you take the minerals from land or from sea? Duncan Curry, an environmental lawyer with Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. Because the reality is if you have seabed mining, you're going to be almost certainly using both. The minerals are going to continue to be produced from land as well as from the, the deep ocean. And therefore, the question arises, you know, are you not opening up a whole new area of environmental damage by starting seabed mining? Matthew Gianni agrees. There's no guarantee that even if you were to mine, say, cobalt in the deep ocean, that the worst of the terrestrial mining operations would shut down as a result. To the contrary, they may even get worse in the sense that terrestrial mining operations that are trying to improve their human rights and labor standards, trying to improve their environmental performance, might end up 
cutting back on investments in these sorts of things if they had to compete with cheaper metals coming out of the deep oceans. You know, they might decide to cut costs and ignore or otherwise work to limit or reduce environmental regulations and rules or child labor standards or whatever. This sounds like something that really needs to be worked out first. Surely we cannot allow seabed mining to start if we know it will make land-based mining even worse. But we have a chance to do this right. Right now at the International Seabed Authority, member states are negotiating a set of rules for seabed mining. It's called the Mining Code. And it even includes provisions on compensating countries that depend on land-based mining. Well, scientists and environmental groups are very, very concerned about the way the International Seabed Authority works. There's a growing recognition that the world isn't ready to start doing this and a real worry that the ISA, because of its bylaws and the structure and the decision-making process that's in play at the moment, will drag the world into deep sea bed mining without the full consent of the international community as a whole or the ability for all of us to collectively decide whether this is a good idea or not and how much more information we need before we can make informed decisions. In the last episode of Mining the Deep, what's going on at the International Seabed Authority? And do we have a chance to set things straight before large-scale seabed mining really takes off? Mining the Deep is hosted by me, Marcy Trent Long, and produced by Sam Columby in collaboration with China Dialogue. The series is mixed by Chris Wood. Thanks to all our guests for helping us unravel this complicated issue, to Miguel Ermaneda for his voiceover, and Alexander Mobison for his intro music made from repurposed and recovered waste items. Additional thanks to the podcast After the Fact by Pew Charitable Trusts for providing audio from a speech by Michael Lodge. Thank you to the entire Sustainable Asia team, Bonnie and Heidi Au, Josie Chan, Crystal Wu, and Jill Baker. 